Hi all, I want to ask the question to you today, has chess gone digital? Now I want to ask this question because I think there is an increasing usage nowadays of chess engines and technology and these can be used to dissect games either when they're completed or, or on the fly for commentary and also puzzles, you know there used to be a time when when puzzles were presented and you know some sometimes errors would go unnoticed but now because everyone has engines they can find errors immediately or if you know a, a grandmaster dared to write a book with his own technical analysis he'd probably be torn to shreds with people you know using engines like ribka you know and shredder so you know nowadays books they need to be computer checked puzzle books need to be computer checked and I just wonder you know has the baby been thrown out with the bathwater that expression you know from from social science really is is saying you know has the, the fundamental purpose of the game which was to provide enjoyment entertainment you know intellectual challenge I hope you know we are not throwing that away when we subject things to the intense scrutiny of computer analysis so that, that's really um, the question I want to pose. As I'm posing the question, let's step through the Evergreen game, which was played in 1852. So this was between Anderson, Adolf Anderson, and Jean Dufries. So the Berlin Evergreen started off with e4 and e5. And after knight f3, knight c6, we seem to have a normal system for day, for day standards, but now already the surprise, back then they didn't used to play bishop b5, the royal Pez, they used to play bishop c4 a lot. And after bishop c5, it wasn't the old stodge, as Exeter Chess Club would, would say, with knight c3 or castles. No, they used to gambit pawns. And in, in that time, b4 was a very dangerous gambit with um, a, a reputation. It's called the Evans Gambit. So, um, Captain Evans, I think, was a seaman. And in, in returning to the question now with this gambit, you know, nowadays, when I was at the British Championship earlier in the year, someone in the major op open section, a friend of mine from about 20 years ago, he was saying a lot of the juniors he had had to play in the major open, they don't sacrifice pawns nowadays because they're all playing Fritz. And Fritz teaches them that when they sack a pawn, they end up losing. So there's this kind of cynicalism of giving away material and that's all driven by this technology and so I just wonder you know is there a technological determinism going on I think that that's a, a social science phrase again this idea that technology determines the new kind of jobs and opportunities and the way people you know behave and, and what they do or is there the strategic choice that you know we as humans can decide still how we use that technology to benefit our lives rather than make our lives you know less boring for example so you know you want to automate the things that um, are boring but leave you know other things which are interesting and creative you know still up to the people don't try and automate too much so here we see a gambit which um, you know in those days of the romantic era ga gambits were, were you know accepted as the way of playing you know with guts and um, if this game itself was put under engine inspection, you know, it's flawed, you know, why it's giving away material, the engines, they wouldn't like it, you know, what, what is all this rubbish, they would say, with their, you know, computer evaluations, but um, white has a strong initiative, and if you're playing black against Anderson in this position, you know, you've got uh, backward development, your king's still in the center, and with his reputation at the time, you know, you'd be scared, because after queen b3, you know, your f7 pawn is now under fire, how would you defend that? Well, De Vries, he defended with queen f6. I'm just going to say that e5 was played here. So the queen is put in potentially an attacking position against the white king. As we'll see later, actually, um, that becomes an interesting aspect of this game, that the white king, he, he allows his king to be almost attacked um, to the point of fatality, but then we see a brilliant combination emerge. So rook e1 and indirectly the rook you know is attacking the black king so it just needs this e pawn to get out of the way and we're going to see something later on that theme so knight g e7 and after bishop a3 you know does black want to castle or play something else well the okay let's briefly say the engines that do like d5 here with, with advantage to black 
But um, the opponents, you know, he's not looking at every single candidate move like a computer. He played actually just um, b5, which he thought was good, because intuitively he wanted to get that bishop on this diagonal, uh, attacking the white king. So after queen takes b5, rook b8, the queen moved to a4, and after bishop b6, black is preparing now the possibility of bishop b7. So after knight d2, bishop b7. So this is, you know, a hacking game from both sides. They both want to get it at each other's king. So Adolf Anderson, he plays now knight e4. So whose king is safer here? After queen f5, now bishop takes d3 was played, and the queen reroutes to h5. But now, can you see how white opened up the e-file? It's a beautiful way he opened up the e-file. If this pawn can just somehow get out of the way, that's the clue. Basically, white played knight f6. And black has to take that, really, because otherwise he's losing his queen. So he took that on f6. And after e takes f6, there's a slight side effect of this knight f6, which... Um, would seem dangerous intuitively to the white player that was this attack premature against the black king in the centre because now he's giving black the g-file and surely rook g8 would seem to be very dangerous for the white king so would you consider that the white king is in great danger because now look that threat of queen takes f3 which is purely theoretical before is now seemingly a very practical threat here so rook ad1 and we see the rooks seemingly lined up against sensitive squares against the opponent's king. But he has left on. Queen takes f3, hasn't he? Was it just a major blunder that he's just played? He's allowed queen takes f3. Or, or was it? Can you spot something here? The first move of a brilliant combination. Well, actually, the, f the move here... I'll give you five seconds to see if you can spot it. So you're faced with mate in one, actually. So bear that in mind. This mate in one is a bit annoying. So you've got to do something quick. So that doesn't leave you too many alternative moves here, in fact, to play. Because actually, you don't also want to play g3, because this bishop and queen is going to be nasty on the diagonal. Something like knight d4, and you're going to be mated on g2. So what do you play here? Well, I hope you've guessed the first move. It's rook takes e7, so that keeps you from being mated at least and ask black to do something about the check so after knight takes e7 now here i'll give you five seconds or you may want to stop the video what did white play here starting from now okay another forcing move is required you're threatened with mating one on g2 so queen takes d7 a beautiful move putting this game in, in the history books, this beautiful queen sacrifice. Everyone loves queen sacrifices. That is still you know, the strategic choice of many people. When they, when they look at puzzles and games, they, they seem to love queen sacrifices still. Because there's something you know, against the digital, digital age of sacrificing your queen. You're not just sacrificing a pawn. You're sacrificing the most powerful piece on the board. If the king takes d7, now what would you play? There's all sorts of alternatives here. There's two discovered checks you can play. Bishop b5 and bishop f5. So which one would you choose? One of them is better than the other. So you've got 50-50 chance here to get it right. I'll give you five seconds. Okay. The move which is right is bishop f5. Check. So that's a double check from the rook and the bishop. Let's quickly look if bishop b5 check was was dangerous. Well actually here black might be able to wriggle out with king e6 because after rook e1 say then bishop e4. So basically bishop f5 keeps the king trapped in the center. So after king is forced to go back now to the first rank because if king c6 then there's bishop d7 mate, so black has to go back to the first rank. And now can you spot a mate in two now? So you're still threatened with mate, you have to keep checking the opponent in this position. So I hope you can spot the move. 
5 seconds starting from now. OK. Bishop d7 check. And after king f8, now the other bishop on the other colour joins its friend to deliver the final mate. Bishop takes e7. So a beautiful game from the romantic era of chess, the evergreen game. Showing, you know, daring gambits, daring sacrifices. Both players going after each other's king. Hell for leather. So I hope, even though we're in the digital age, we can still appreciate at least, you know, the rich culture of chess and the beautiful games that have been played over the ages. Please leave any comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.